Coevolution is defined by Berkeley's understanding evolution as, quote, cases where two or more species reciprocally affect each other's evolution, close quote. And coevolution occurs because two or more organisms engage in symbiosis, which is when two or more organisms live in very close contact with one another. Now, coevolution isn't the same as symbiosis. Symbiosis is just organisms living together, but coevolution is how the populations of organisms evolve over generations together. Symbiosis can be mutually beneficial, as in between bees and flowers, or it could be one-sided, as in between the Eurasian reed warbler and the chukku. Often, the latter case involves parasitism, whether endo- or ectoparasitism, or brood, social, sexual, or hyperparasitism. Endoparasites are those that live on the inside of the host, such as heartworms, while ectoparasites live on the outside, such as leeches. Brood parasites are those that force others to raise their young, such as chukus. Social parasites are those that parasitize other organisms as whole groups. For instance, the ant Polyergus breviceps makes use of slave ants, having a workforce of over 90% slaves. Sexual parasites are parasites that take advantage of other organisms for sex. Amazon mollies are a hybrid fish species of all females that get mollies of other species to, quote, impregnate them. The sperm from the male fish triggers the female to clone herself, but only occasionally is a tiny bit of the male's genetic material passed to the offspring. Lastly, hyperparasitism is when parasites parasitize other parasites. Yes, this really does happen. An example is Darwin's, Australia, not Charles, termite. The protozoan Myxotrichia paradoxa lives in its gut, and spirochete and bacillus bacteria live on the protozoan. Thus, at some point, the bacteria infected the protozoan, and the protozoan infected the termite. So, parasitism is one form of symbiosis, but what are others? Understand that parasitism is when one organism harms another, but other forms of symbiosis include commensalism and mutualism. Commensalism is where one organism benefits without harming another, and one example of this is the remora that lives on sharks. The remora has adapted to adhering to the side of a shark to catch the shark's excess food. And, mutualism is when both organisms benefit from the relationship, such as a clownfish and sea anemone, or a rhinoceros and an oxpecker. But these are examples of facultative mutualism, and I want you to look at obligate mutualism. Obligate mutualism is when one organism depends on another for survival. Clownfish and sea anemones can live perfectly happy lives without each other. But what are examples of organisms that can't? Well, your relationship with mitochondria is one such example. They depend on you for shelter and reproduction, while you depend on them for energy that you gain through the process of cellular respiration. In fact, the process by which the protomitochondrial bacteria was taken into a larger host cell was called endosymbiosis. Another common example that springs to mind is the flowers and bees. Bees need flowers, and flowers need bees. Some flowers have even gone so far as to evolve structures that actually look like bees, such as the bee orchid. At this point, creationists will often gleefully and foolishly say that since these organisms depend on each other for survival, they never could have evolved. As with all other arguments against evolution, this is wrong. Hymenopteran insects, that is, sawflies, wasps, bees, and ants, have been around since the Triassic, around 235 million years ago, while the earliest true angiosperm, the Cretaceous Archaefructus, is dated to about 125 million years ago. Clearly, the hymenopterans were doing other things before the angiosperms arrived, but once they did, bees unknowingly entered a relationship with angiosperms that has lasted millions of years. Bees can transport the flower's pollen to new locations to grow new flowers, while flowers give bees nectar that they can take back to the hive. Over the generations, the two have become inextricably bound to each other. 
Originally, flowers probably relied entirely on wind, water, or accidental interactions with animals to disperse their seeds, as many plants still do. Let me tell you, animals are phenomenal at dispersing seeds. Myrmecacori is seed dispersal by ants alone. Epizoochorus seeds adhere to the outside of animals, like burrs that attach to dog fur. Endozoochorus seeds, on the other hand, are eaten by animals and the seeds are excreted elsewhere. Some plants, such as the neotropical palm tree Shelia, were likely fed upon by gomphotheres, mastodons, glyptodonts, and giant sloths. Other endozoochorus fruits are parasites by nature. The Mediterranean Cetinus hippocystis takes advantage of the beetle Pimela costata for seed dispersal. Now, is there a fossil record of the transition from flowers that didn't rely on bees to those that did? Well, no, and we wouldn't expect to find any. There are, however, modern ecological transitions that we can use to infer the origin of the obligatory mutualistic symbiotic relationship between the two. We start with relationships like the aforementioned one between sea anemones and clownfish, where they can live together but don't have to. It's then not hard to go from there to a relationship where they come to depend upon each other. We can also find examples of modern obligatory mutualisms where both species speciate synchronously. The pitcher plant, Saracenia, dispersed across the Mississippi River and carried with it some ecologically dependent arthropods. The pitcher plant moth, Exira semicrosia, the flesh fly, Sarcophagia saraceniae, and Fletcherimia cellarata, and the spiders, Mesiuminoides formosapes and Pacetia viridans. The 2017 paper, Do Ecological Communities Disperse Across Biogeographic Barriers as a Unit, documents that, quote, Divergence time estimates suggesting two of the species, the pitcher plant moth Exira semicrosia and a flesh fly Sarcophagia saraceniae, dispersed synchronously across this barrier along with the pitcher plant. Close quote. Therefore, we can infer both how coevolutionary relationships start and how they progress. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.